wonderful name, the name Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Philadelphia Baptist Church. You're all looking so fine and well this morning on this beautiful Sunday in October, almost November. The year is just flying by. But the Lord has blessed us with a wonderful day, letting us be in his house this morning and gather together. So if you're a visitor here, we want you to feel welcome this morning and, and just join in with us this morning and worship in the Lord and come back and be with us as much as you possibly can. Love having visitors here at Philadelphia. So good to see you this morning. And how many of you are still young enough to remember the old Big Ben alarm clock? Oh, I know there's some people in here that remember those old big bins. My grandmother, if she's still alive, she'll still be using one today. She's not going on to be with the Lord, but that's all she believed in. She said, that trustworthy big bin. If you don't know what a big bin is, they were about that big around. They had two bells on the top with an old striker in the middle. Now, the thing about the old big bin was <laughs> you better remember to wind it every night before you go to bed. If you didn't, you didn't like today, you didn't have a battery, you had to wind that thing. But that old Big Ben, when you set it there and it would go off in the morning, that old striker hitting those bells, it would echo through the house and rattle the walls. Nobody could sleep through the old Big Ben. But that wasn't the fun part. The fun part as a kid, little old young boy, I remember when that thing would go off, we'd be chasing it across the table. Because <laughs> if you know anything about a Big Ben, when that thing starts ringing, here it goes. And my fun, fun to me was, is running from one side of the table to the other to make sure it didn't fall off. But love those old big being alarm clocks. Now you say, why in the world did you mention an alarm clock? Well, in case you don't know, it's 11.04 today. Next Sunday morning, it'll be 10.04. So if you don't know, time changes next Sunday morning at 2 a.m. So everybody give it 2 a.m. Change the clock back. Okay? No. <laughs> We're fortunate today. Today we have these old boring alarm clocks, you know, atomic clocks. They set their self. We don't have to worry about it. But we set all that to say this. Don't forget to wind your big bend for next Sunday morning. But it will, we time will move back an hour. I don't want anybody in the house to lose that beauty sleep. We all need it. That extra hour of beauty sleep that we'll get next Sunday morning. So uh, remember that. Time does change, and if you're not aware of it, be aware of it. It changes next Sunday morning at 2 a.m., so just to keep that in mind. So we have, uh, just for our prayer request this morning, don't remember the sick. Those that are sick and can't be with us, just remember those. And um, those uh, still keep praying for those where the storm has affected in many, many areas in Florida's and the Carolinas and, and all those areas, um, Tennessee, where the storm has affected. Continue to remember those people. I know there's several agencies around now that are still collecting and still taking up stuff. So continue to remember and pray for all those. And uh, many other, I'm sure there's unspoken prayer requests in the house this morning. So just continue to remember those. And if you will remember us next weekend, uh, next weekend we do get rid of, I mean, marry off our youngest daughter. So uh, remember that, remember remember, send prayer for that, it's going to be a long day on Saturday, it's an evening wedding, so uh, we will be uh, doing that all day next Saturday, so remember that, remember send prayer for that. We'll be uh, experiencing that empty nester syndrome that we've had a new chapter in life, and I've had some people, wouldn't tell my daughter this, but I've had some people tell me, oh, it's wonderful, you know, that's what they say, but I'm going to keep that to myself, Don't, we're not going to say that to anybody, you know, but uh, keep that quiet, you know, but anyway. But no, uh, but anyway, that'd be next weekend. So y'all keep us in prayer on that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again this day. We thank you, Lord, for this another beautiful, beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house, Father. We're so thankful, Lord, to have this opportunity and the freedom just to come and to worship you, Father. We're so thankful, Lord, for each one that's gathered here this morning. Father, I pray you just bless each and every home that's represented. Bless each one for coming this way, Father. I just pray that they just leave the house Lord, today with something, Lord, more than what they had when they came in. And, Father, I just pray that you just bless. Be with us through the service. Meet with us, Lord. Touch, Lord, in the service today. If there may be one here that's lost, I pray they just look to you. Lord, accept you as our personal Savior for it's everlasting too late. Now, Lord, I pray, Lord, for the prayer request for those in need. Father, you know all about it. Those that are sick and afflicted, Father, we pray you just touch, bless, and work in their hearts and lives. Be the comforter and their provider. Father, we just pray, Lord, again, that you just bless our church here upon this hill. Help us, Lord, to shine out, not just locally, 
but all over the world. Bless the missionaries, and we just pray, Father, that your word, Lord, would just continue to be spread all across the world, and all souls may be saved, Lord, before it's eternally too late. Father, again, we pray, bless each one that come this way. Bless the service today. We pray, Father, that, Lord, that just do something wonderful in our service today, and we give you the praise, honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. For announcements this morning, don't forget about prayer rooms. Be at 545 this afternoon. Service will be at 6 p.m. And they will be street ministry today at 3 p.m. At first we had it, there was no street ministry, but there's going to be street ministry today at 3 p.m. Now, the Christmas program practice will be this evening at 4.30. It will practice every Sunday until the play. Saturday practice will be on November the 2nd at 3. 5 p.m. fellowship to follow the practice. And if you have any questions that, you can see Sister Jackie about that for any details. Now, this Friday, which should be November the 1st, this Friday will be Family Fun Night. That's for PCS, the Philadelphia Christian School. It's always a wonderful time. You have a great time there. 5.30 at Skyline Baptist Church Gym. All are invited. That's everyone's invited to that. This is a fundraiser for the school athletic department. Now, admission will be $2 for students, and it will be $5 for adults, no more than $15 for families. Now, this is a fundraiser, so if you feel like giving a little bit more, I don't think they'll argue with you about it. Okay, they'd appreciate that. So it is a fundraiser, free for children four years and younger. So games for all ages. There's going to be an auction. There's going to be a, a free throw contest. There's going to be a three-point shootout, concessions, all that wonderful stuff. So everyone, if you can, try to come out this Friday, November the 1st, for Family Fun Night. I think about everyone knows where Skyline Baptist Church is at, so that will be there at the gym. So look forward to that. Now, there is a sign-up sheet. They wanted me to mention this. There's a sign-up list for the meal next Saturday. And if you have any questions about that at all, see Sister Jackie or Sister uh, Deanna Bowman, and they can fill you in on that, uh, that list, sign-up list for the meal. And if you are a guest, if you would, we would uh, appreciate it. If you, uh, if you got a bulletin, there's a uh, QR code. If you just scan that code inside that bulletin and fill out that information, let us know a little bit more about you and you a little bit more about us. We would really appreciate that. Again, it's so good to see each and every one in the Lord's house this morning. Pray he'll continue to meet with us and do something wonderful in our service today. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll start with a song. In your church hymnal, it's 131 if you need that. 131, holy, holy, holy. Yeah. 
like a bird out of prison. That's taking his flight like the blind man that God gave back his sight. Like the poor wretched beggar has found fortune and fame. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out to his holy name. Thank God I
Ain't somebody just here about a church, man. That's the one that saved my soul. Amen. That's the one that bore my sins on Calvary, yes, man. Yes. That's the one walks with me every day. He don't leave, never gonna leave me. Ain't never gonna forsake me. He's been Amen. there when I let him down. He just stand there waiting and say, come on back, son. Yes. Come on back. I tell him, boy, I work with him. I tell him, I said, man, just live for him, dude. Just live for him, man. You'll fall down. He'll come over and say, come on, son. Come on, get up. Don't stay there. Get up. I got something I got you to do, man. That's something right there. You got somebody on your side if you're saved that'll just keep you going, man. Keep you in the fight, man. Doing for him, man. Praise God. I know who Jesus is. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. 143, if you need the page. 143. My Jesus, I love thee.
I think I finally, after all these years, figured out how to get the, all the gl glittering, all the syllables in that. I've had trouble with that ever since I started singing that song. And Trevor's helped me with that, so we've got it, we've got it down now. I'm happy that you're here this morning. Good morning to you, and looking forward to a great Lord's Day. Our men are coming to receive the offering this morning, and uh, let's give to the Lord as He's so graciously given to us. Thank you for your faithful giving, and uh, it allows us to be able to support missionaries all over the world and to keep up what God's doing here, and we're so thankful for that. I want to just reiterate and encourage, uh, Brother Derek gave all the announcements there for the Friday uh, a family fun night, and I just want to reiterate uh, uh, that all are welcome to come, and I uh, sure love to see some of you there, even if you don't have kids in the school, love to see you there, it'd be a great time, come have some fun and fellowship, and be able to be a part of something great. And so I would encourage you to come if you can. I think you'll have a great time. It'll be a great blessing to the school. And uh, thank you for that. Let's pray and ask God to help us today. We've got uh, uh, Lord willing, John 16 this morning. I want us to pray that God would use us as we preach. And then the resurrection this evening for 1 John 15. And then pray for our street ministry and all that goes on there, youth ministry, all that's going on there, that God would bless all of it, that he'd get glory today out of all that's said and done. Brother Wall Raven, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer this morning? They come to sing. I want to pray for uh, Celeste and Hunter. They were slotted to sing this morning. They're six, so pray for them. a little mess about there. Y'all probably heard the guitar. It fell, and I think it got out of tune when it fell, so just one second.
that faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall All right, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 16 this morning. The Gospel of John, chapter number 16. That has to be one of my favorite lines in a song. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. I am not against the new song, but I'm going to tell you, it's hard to beat them old hymnals, isn't it? Redeeming love has been my theme. John, chapter 16. John, chapter 16. We are nearing the end of... Another section in our study of the Gospel of John, I I know I've repeated this outline several times and I've done that on purpose. They say that repetition is the mother of learning and so I've tried to repeat this outline as we've went over and over and over again because I want you to be able to get a good overview of John's Gospel, a good understanding of the big picture, so to speak. And uh, so we studied in the first six chapters of John's gospel what I've titled the period of consideration. And Jesus was presented and uh, he was given to his people, to the Jewish people, for the consideration and evaluation. And then we studied in chapter 6 through chapter number 12 what I called the period of conflict. Jesus was attacked and he was maligned and he was ultimately rejected by the Jews at large. And then now for several weeks and even months, we've looked at what I've called the period of confidence. Jesus has taken his disciples aside. His public ministry has concluded. And now he's giving his disciples some final confidential lessons, final confidential words of exhortation and encouragement before he goes to the cross. We're going to get to chapter number 17, Lord willing, next week, and we're going to open up what I'm calling in that one chapter, the period of conference. Jesus is going to have a conversation with his Father, and he allows us to get in on that conversation. What a rich passage of Scripture that John chapter 17 is. And then we'll get to in chapter 18, beginning in chapter 18, the period of the crucifixion. Of course, uh, Jesus obviously is going to be arrested and then crucified on the cross. But as we come back to chapter 16 this morning, we end this period of confidence. When I begin our reading in verse number 16, if you'll pick up your reading with me there in verse number 16, a little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves, of that which I said, a little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. You shall sorrow, you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child... She remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. 
And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I pray not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, and now is come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, God, for your word this morning, the encouragement that we, that we uh, get from your word. We're grateful this morning that we are on the winning side, and Lord, we're so thankful that no matter what happens in this world, we know that, God, you have won the victory on the cross of Calvary, and we give you the glory for that. We thank you for this Lord's day and the opportunity we have to meet together and to worship. Bless now the preaching and the teaching of your word, and we'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. None of us can fully appreciate the misery that the disciples experienced in their last night before Jesus was going to be crucified. The disciples had been awake at this point through the night. Uh, The night had began in the upper room. You remember Jesus washes his disciples' feet and then he begins to reveal to them some very disturbing information. They learn that among them there is one that is going to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. They learn that soon Peter, their bold and brash leader, is going to deny that he has any association with the Lord Jesus Christ. They learn that Jesus is about to leave them and The world that they would be left behind in is not going to love them. They're going to hate them, and they're going to persecute them, and they're even going to murder them for their faith. You can kind of imagine perhaps the emotions that the disciples were experiencing. They had thought that soon they would be living in this restored kingdom. That uh, Jesus, their master, would soon take his seat on the throne and they would fill these great positions of power and leadership. And now Jesus says, I'm about to go away and you're going to be hated by the world. It's quite the turn of events for these disciples. There's no way we can really describe the disappointment that they would have felt at this time. They exit the upper room. They descend from the walls of Jerusalem down through the Kidron Valley up the slope of Mount Olivet. Soon, Jesus is going to repeatedly cast himself down in the Garden of Gethsemane in prayer. Soon, Peter is going to deny that he even knows the Lord Jesus Christ. Soon, the ravenous mobs are going to come and they're going to carry the Lord Jesus away as some common criminal. And there's no way can understand their misery. They're confused. They're afraid, and they're sorrowing in their hearts. And Jesus says in uh, verse number 6 of our chapter, But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. 
these disciples where they're, they're on the brink of troubling times, troubling days, dark hours. But in this last chapter, in these last 18 verses I just read to you, Jesus speaks five times of having joy. There is a theme that Jesus speaks of in these last verses, this last message to his disciples about joy. And I'm speaking this morning on finding joy in troubled times. How many think we need a message right now about finding joy in troubled times? I don't think I've got to convince you that we are living in and on the brink of very troubling days. Now, I know that we preachers, we've been preaching about living in dark days and living in troubling times. I, I remember when I first started preaching, I only had one message, and it was about how bad America was and how we all need to get right with God. And, and, and that's a true message, it's just not the only message. But I remember preaching that, and, and that message was true then, and, and as bad as it was then, as bad as it was just 15 short years ago, we're not living in the world we were living in 15 years ago. It's like the wickedness has, has multiplied a hundredfold over the last 15 years. And I've said it before, but it's like hell has vomited itself in our world and, and wickedness is prevailing. It's like all this wickedness that was once in the dark and once in the closet has, not, has now all been brought out to light. And I try not to get too political when I preach because I feel like I've only got a short amount of time to preach and I'd rather preach the Bible than politics. However, we are at a crossroads in our country. There is no doubt about that. And it is a disturbing thing to think about another four years of what we just got. Amen. It's a disturbing thing about, to think about how far we could go in the next four years. I read an article the other day that said the American dream is dead, and I thought more than the dream is dead. But it is different. And I remember as a, young, I remember as a child growing up, there was a sense of a anticipation with what you would do with your life. There was a sense of, of, of pride, if you will, not in a, a, a wrong, necessarily wrong sense of, of living in our country. It was a place that was free, and it was a place that you could, you could pursue your ambitions and, and a place that, that you could be Whatever you set your heart to be, whatever, uh, and understand, I'm not talking about not following the direction of God, but I mean, you could, you could uh, pursue things in life and you could become something at one time. We said, that, I used to say, I'm proud to be an American. I hope this don't offend you this morning, but I'm not proud to be an American. So man, I, you shouldn't have said that. If our leadership is a reflection of who we are, I'm not proud to be an American. And I say all that to say this, we're not headed in a real good direction, are we? I mean, these are some troubling days ahead of us. We're on the brink of, unless something just absolutely turns around, we're, we're heading into very troubling days. And some of us, we're trying to raise a family in these troubling days. We're trying to lead people to Christ. We're trying to, to win people to Christ and serve Christ. And these days are troubling, but Jesus' disciples are heading into some troubling days, and Jesus encourages his disciples, ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. The word joy, it's the passion or the emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. It is the delight of mind from the consideration of the present or assured approaching possession of a good. In other words, let me just say it in just, just plain old terms. When you've got joy, you don't spend your life living in despair and in depression because you have a confident expectation of something good. Amen. That's joy. And Jesus says to his disciples, hey guys, you're about to go through some troubling times, but you don't have to despair because you've got an expectation of something good, both present and to come. 
And you can have joy in troubling times. And so let's listen in. Let's listen in to Jesus' words of encouragement to his disciples. First of all, in our text, there is a principle to grasp. A principle to grasp. Verse number 16, go back there with me. Jesus says, a little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Verse 17, then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, and because I go to the Father. Verse 18, they said, Therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. They're confused. What is he talking about? What does he mean, a little while, and you won't see me? And then again, in a little while, you will see me. What in the world is Jesus saying to us? Verse 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him because he knows all things and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and you shall not see me again, a little while and you shall see me. Jesus said, hey, y'all want to know what I'm talking about? Do you want to know what I'm talking about? Verse number 20, verily, verily, listen up, verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Amen. Jesus says, you're going to weep and you're going to lament. You're going to be sorrowful. What are the disciples about to be sorrowful about? Jesus is about to die. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be tried. He's about to be sentenced to death. He's about to be scourged by the Romans. He's about to be crucified. The next few days for the disciples are going to be a time of weeping and going to be a time of misery and sorrow. And Jesus says, the world is going to rejoice. You're going to sorrow. You're going to weep. But the world is going to be happy. They're going to rejoice that I'm gone. They're going to celebrate a victory. And ye shall be sorrowful, Jesus says. They put their entire lives into following Jesus. Everything they had, they had cast aside to follow Christ. They had given their lives. They believed he was their Messiah. They believed he would lead them to victory. They believed he would lead them to the kingdom. They loved Jesus. They lived for Jesus. And when Jesus says, I'm going to the cross to die, they are in extreme sorrow. But Jesus says, you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. In other words, Jesus says, God is going to take the very thing that you're going to be sorrowful about, and he's going to transform that into joy. And he illustrates. He illustrates. Look in verse number 21. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. I've obviously never birthed a child because men don't do that, right? I know a lot of people are confused about that. I got to get, I got to, don't get sidetracked. I've never done that. I've watched four children be birthed. Uh, in fact, 12 years ago today, I watched my first child birthed into this world. And I remember that. I'll never forget, especially that first one, and thinking, man, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> and I, I remember looking at my wife about halfway through that long labor, and it was, I don't know, what was it, like 12 hours? 36 hours. Okay, like three <laughs> times what I thought. So, and I'm thinking, halfway through that, I said to her, we're not doing this again. <laughs> like, I was crying for her. I was like, this is terrible. This is awful. We're not going to do this again. But there's something amazing that happens. It's like a miracle. 36 hours of labor and pain and sorrow, and then the moment that baby was placed in her arms, it was like a switch was flipped. And suddenly all of that sorrow and all of that pain and all of that labor, it was like it was forgotten for joy that a man was born into the world. Watch this. The same baby that caused the pain also caused the joy. And Jesus says in verse number 22, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, 
and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. I'm about to go to the cross, Jesus says. I'm about to die for yours. I'm about to, you're going to sorrow. You're going to lament. You're going to weep like a woman bearing a child. But Jesus says, don't worry because you're going to see me again. They didn't get it. But Jesus was saying the very thing that is causing you sorrow, my death on the cross, is going to be the very same thing that's going to bring you joy. The same baby that caused the pain, the same baby that caused the joy. And Jesus says that joy, when you have that joy, no man is going to be able to take that from you. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave would bring a joy to the disciples that no man and no circumstance could ever take away from them. The very thing that brought sorrow, God used to bring joy when he brought salvation by grace through faith alone. They were going to face hardships. They were going to face hatred from the world. But no man could take their joy because they knew that they were saved by Christ's death and Christ's resurrection. And this morning, I want to tell you, life is full of sorrows. We're living in a fallen world. We're going to face difficulties. We're going to face dark days. We're going to face death. But if you're in here this morning and you're saved by the good grace of God, you have a joy that nobody can take from you. And here's the principle to grasp this morning. God will turn our joy, our sorrow, into joy. God will turn our sorrow into joy. I believe that John's talk, Jesus, rather that little while he's talking about is the time between his death and his resurrection. But I'm going to tell you, there's a principle here. That's the primary interpretation between his death and his resurrection. But there's a principle here. And here it is. The world rejoices right now while we suffer. They rejoice and they have their fun and they have their parties and they celebrate their sin and they flaunt their wickedness, but they better enjoy it while they can. Let me say it this way. They better enjoy it for a little while. Because I'm going to tell you, in a little while, Jesus is coming again. In a short little while, Jesus is coming again, and he is going to transform our sorrow into joy. And like a mother that had a baby, we'll forget about all the sorrows that we experience in this life, and we'll have a joy that no man can take away. And right now, we have a joy that no man can take away because we are saved by his death and resurrection. So we see a principle to grasp. Principle to grasp. Number two, there is a promise to believe. Promise to believe. Look, look, look in verse number 23. And in that day, in that day, what day? That is the day after Jesus' resurrection. And I don't believe he's talking about a 24-hour period day here. I believe he's talking about an, 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 an era. In that day, after I have been crucified and after I have been resurrected, Jesus says in verse, 19, verse number 23, ye shall ask me nothing. For the last three and a half years, when the disciples needed something, who did they ask? Jesus, right? When, when they, uh, they had a question, they went to Jesus. When they had a need, they asked Jesus. But Jesus says, in that day, after my death and resurrection, you're not going to ask me for anything anymore. You're not going to come to me anymore because there is going to be a new situation in your prayer life. There's going to be a new situation in your praying. Look in verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. <laughs> verse 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Up until now, you've not asked anything in my name. You've asked me. You've came to me. But then you're going to ask in my name. Verse 24, ask and ye shall receive that your what? There it is again, that your joy may be full. Up until this point, Jesus says, you've not prayed in my name. You've prayed directly to me, but you've not prayed in my name. How many of you remember what Jesus told his disciples in John 14? He told them in John 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Y'all remember that? We talked about in my name, what it meant to pray in Jesus' name. When you pray in Jesus' name, that's not a magic formula, but that's praying something Jesus would pray. 
That's aligning yourself with the will of God. We know we align ourselves with the will of God as we align ourselves with the word of God and we pray in Christ's name. Jesus, verse number 26, at that day you shall ask in my name and say not, unto, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Jesus says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you that I'm gonna pray, I'm not gonna pray for you anymore. Not like pray for you, but I'm not gonna pray in your place anymore. You now have direct access to the Father. During Jesus' earthly ministry, when they, came, when they needed a miracle, they came to Jesus. When they, needed, when they needed understanding, they came to Jesus. When they needed forgiveness, they came to Jesus. But Jesus says, look, I'm not going to do all your praying for you anymore. You have direct access to God through me. You pray to God through me. In my name, you pray to God. Verse number 27, for the Father himself, watch this, loveth you. God loves you. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. God loves you. You can go to him and you can pray to him. You think about these disciples, they're troubled at the going away of their Savior. What are they going to do when they've got questions? What are they going to do when they have needs? Jesus encourages them that though he would be gone physically, they would have direct access to the heavenly Father. That's a pretty good promise, isn't it? And what about this? This morning, me and you, we have direct access to God. We have a direct line. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed. That's Jesus, by the way. That's not a man. We have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. Here's the invitation. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you realize this morning that because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, you have, the, you have access to the very God that created this world? You have access to the all-powerful, all-knowing, all, every, all, omniscient, omnipresent. God, you have access to him. You don't have to go through Mary. You don't have to go through a man. You don't have to go through the saints. You, have, you don't have to go through me. You can go to God, and you can pray in Jesus' name, and you have a direct line to God. That's a promise to believe. And so how do we find joy in a troubled world? We find joy in a troubled world by believing in the promise that we have access to God through the Son. You say, oh, preacher, but what about this world? I mean, it's falling apart right now, and I'm just worried about what's going to happen next. Well, God hears and answers prayers. Pick up the phone. You've got direct access to Him. Tell Him about it. Preacher, I don't know. I mean, what about this election? What's going to happen? I'm troubled. God gave you direct access to Him. Pick up the line and call. I don't know what's going to happen, but what about the economy if it bombs out and, and, and if everything goes south? Pick up the phone. You've got direct access to God. You can call him anytime. You can ring. You can call his line. He's always on the other line. And it brings joy to our hearts this morning, just knowing that no matter what happens in this world, we have access to our Heavenly Father. And I'm going to tell you, folks, on a Sunday morning in 2024, we better learn to pray. You open the book of Acts, follow the ministry, the early ministry, early church. You know what they did? They prayed. They prayed. They knew that God was there. They knew they had access to God. And I'm going to tell you, we have got to get back to praying. I was talking to Brother Darrell yesterday and, and, and talking about just where, where the state of most of our churches are in our country. And I'm going to tell you this morning, we have got to get back to the basics. We've got so much fluff when it comes to our churches in our country. So much fluff. And I wonder what's going to happen when all that fluff is gone. I mean, when the world, when, 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 uh, when, when the world and the devil turns the heat up on our, all our churches, I wonder what's going to happen when all, the, all the, 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 the fluff and all the exterior things and the superficial things don't exist anymore. Why was prayer so important to these apostles, these disciples? Why was this so encouraging to them? Because I'm going to tell you, they didn't have, they didn't have a, a worship team. 
They didn't have a, a great facility to bank on. They didn't have access to media and all these things to, 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 to promote and, and, and all the cutting edge things. And I'm not against some of those things, but, but, but they didn't have any of that. All they had was the Word of God and prayer. And I think about people uh, over in China, and, and I think, man, they're meeting this morning, and, and well, I guess it's this tonight, and they met yesterday, and they got together all over China in little pockets of places and little buildings somewhere that nobody else knew, and they were hiding. And all they had was a Bible and the Word of God and prayer. And they didn't have a light show, and they didn't, they didn't have a fog show, and, and, and I don't mean this wrong, but they don't even have a choir. And I, I'm for keeping the choir until Jesus comes again. But they didn't have any of the fluff. All they had was the ministry of the word and prayer and I just I'm just been thinking about our churches and these days that we're headed into and we're headed into troublesome days and I'm going to tell you if we don't get satisfied with just the word of God and prayer we're going to have trouble in the days ahead it's going to have to be enough for us Just to, I wonder this morning in most churches in America if they just cut everything out and just said let's just do one let's just cut everything else out and just get up with the Bible and we just preach the word of God and we all just pray together I wonder how many people would keep coming to church if we didn't have all the facilities and, and, and all, the, all the fluff, yeah. I'm going to tell you, we better get back to praying. We better get back to learning how to ask and believe and pray and, 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 and believe that God in heaven hears our prayers. And here's what Jesus says to his disciples. Guys, no matter what happens, well, no matter what happens in these days ahead, you've got access to God. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know what's going to happen in, in, in the days ahead of us, but I know this, we've got a direct line to our Heavenly Father. We've got access to Him. And there is a promise we've got to believe. We've got to believe that. We've got to believe that, church. We've got to believe. There's a principle to grasp. There is a promise to believe. But then there is a position to claim. Verse number 33 is the climax to this upper room discourse, which is not really all given in the upper room, but we call it the upper room discourse, but it begins in John 13, and this is, this is it. This is the climax. This is how it all ends. Jesus is about to be arrested. He's about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. These are the last encouraging words Jesus gives to his disciples. Verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you. Everything Jesus has said to them in this discourse, he said, I've said these things to you that in me, in me. How do you get in Christ? In me. The Bible tells us that when you get saved, that you are in Christ. And Jesus says, in me, you might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation. He didn't say we might have tribulation. He said you shall. Paul reiterated his words. He said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Lord says, it's not a might. You're going to have hard times, tribulation, severe affliction, distress of life, vexation. That's what tribulation means. In Scripture, it often denotes troubles that precede from or proceed rather from persecution. So Jesus is making a guarantee to his disciples that they're about to face affliction and they're about to face persecution for their faith. How many remember how the chapter began? You remember that? John 15 closes out. Jesus talking about persecution. Chapter 16, Jesus says, I'm telling you these things because I don't want you to be offended when that time comes. I don't want you to quit when you face tribulation and persecution. And he goes on to tell them, you're going to be kicked out of synagogues and people are going to hate you and they're, going to they're, going to, they're even going to kill you, Jesus says. They're going to martyr you for your faith. He got real with his disciples. He said, guys, it's going to be hard, but here's the climax. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Cheer up. <laughs> About what? You just told, you just said we're all going to be hated. You just said we're going to get kicked out of the synagogues and that people are going to martyr and murder us for our faith. What is there to be cheerful about? Jesus says, be of good cheer. I have over." Come the world. Yeah. Yeah. Fellas, it's going to be hard. It's going to look like you're on the losing team sometimes. 
You're going to get kicked out of the synagogues and you're going to get persecuted and you're going to get stoned and left for dead and some of you are going to have your heads chopped off. And I'm going to tell you, at times, it's going to look like the devil's running the score up on y'all. At times, it's going to look like there's no hope, like you're on the losing side. But fella, I, fellas, I just want you to know that we're already on the winning side. I just want you to understand that the victory's already been won because 2,000 years ago, they are 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and when he was buried and placed in that borrowed tomb, all of hell celebrated the victory. They thought that they had they had won the victory over our Savior. But on the third day, the Lord Jesus Christ got up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And I'm telling you, we are on the winning side. And it may look like in 2024 that sometimes the devil is running the score up. And you may be wringing your hands thinking, I don't know what's going to happen if this election goes the wrong way. And I don't know what's going to happen if our economy me tanks out. I'll tell you what's going to happen. We're still on the winning side. It don't matter who's in the White House. We're still on the winning side. Our Heavenly Father is still on His throne. He's still in control. He's coming back again someday. And when He comes again, we're going back with Him. And we're going to live for Him, with Him for all eternity. But if everything goes wrong, be of good cheer. We're on the winning side. We have overcome because He has overcome. That's something to be encouraged about when it seems like all hope is lost. We're on the winning side because he is on the winning side. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Once I drifted out in sin, I had no hope, no peace within. <laughs> Once I drifted out in sin, I had no hope, no peace within. And my soul was burdened down with pride. Watch this. But then my Savior came along and he showed me I was wrong and he placed me on the winning side. If you know what I'm saying. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sea, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word and the encouragement that we find in it. There may be somebody this morning that's discouraged, thinking about all the things going on in this life and in this world. And it can be. There's no doubt about it. But God, I want, you, I want to thank you that you've given us a promise. You've given us a position. We're, we're not losers in this thing. It might look like it sometimes, but we're not because you're not. And I pray that you'd encourage our hearts in these days to continue to live for you Continue to serve you, and we'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together all over as Trevor comes to lead us and whatever song it is he'd like to lead us. Maybe you just need to find a place and ask God to give you a little bit of encouragement this morning to help you see past all this mess going on in our world and know that we have the victory in Christ Jesus. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up. Keep serving God. Keep raising your family for Jesus. Keep living for Him because we will win in the end. What's your number, Trevor? Page 330. Let's sing it together. I need thee every hour. I need thee. me now.
this morning. Whether it feels like it or not, you are. And uh, we got to do our part. We got to do our part. You need to go vote. Amen. Go to the polls. Vote. Cast your vote. Pray. Ask God to do what only God can do. But at the end of the day, really don't matter because we're on the winning side. And I thank God for that. I want you to be back in your place this evening if you can. Looking forward to being in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to talk about the resurrection. That might encourage us a little bit too, you think? Amen. Amen. So I hope you'll be here. Uh, any announcements here that I need to uh, will? 3 o'clock, is that right? 3 o'clock, street preaching. So if you're a part of that, then you can be, be here for that. Choir, I mean, uh, not choir practice, but play practice at 4.30. And so if you're a part of that, be here for that. Thank you for being here this morning. I see some guests here. Some of you I don't, uh, maybe maybe first time you've been here, uh, if, if that's the case, Maddie and Micah are going to the back. They'll be at the back. They want to greet you. They'll give you a little gift just to show your appreciation for you being here with us this morning. Let's dismiss in prayer. Ask God to bless the remainder of the day ahead of us. Uh, uh, Brother Tyler, would you pray for us this morning?